not here last week. I'm Ted Landsmark, and uh, I am uh, head of the uh, Dukakis Center, and I facilitate these discussions. Um, I, let me also say that uh, uh, due to popular request, demand, uh, we will reinstitute the uh, seven to ten minute break in the middle of the session. <laughs> some, some, some folks like to stretch or, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll do that um, probably a little bit uh, before seven. Uh, the group of students that um, you saw seated at the front are uh, some of our graduate and undergraduate students who are enrolled in this uh, for uh, matriculating credit. And uh, boy, are we going to have fun with them because uh, they're uh, digging in. They have the opportunity to dig in a bit deeper um, into uh, the subject matter week to week. Um, let me also say that it, it's my understanding that um, there are some of us who uh, are kind of retro and we read uh, newspapers still. <laughs> um, so not, not everyone may have seen uh, the article uh, in today's Boston Globe um, uh, on uh, Mike and Kitty Dukakis. And if you haven't seen uh, this article, I, I commend it to you, um, A, because they're such wonderful people and you want to read the article, um, but B, because um, this article talks to uh, what we try to do within um, the context of the Dukakis Center uh, within Northeastern, uh, for those of you who um, uh, took note of uh, President Aoun's generosity earlier this week, uh, and, and, and in terms of uh, what um, is really important to us. And what this article says is, in effect, there are a lot of things that um, public officials and caring people can do operationally uh, and in terms of uh, developing solutions. They can be data-driven solutions, they can be political solutions, uh, they can be uh, the kinds of solutions that we study um, here in a school that focuses on uh, urban and regional policy. But everything starts, everything starts from having values that matter and a sense of caring for the community within which we live. And Mike and Kitty have done that their whole lives, and I think it's an honor for all of us to be here with them, to share those values and to try to move those values forward in caring and ethical and productive ways. So if you haven't read this article, I will personally thank Mike and Kitty for their work. And also I thank all of you for being here to share in what matters to all of us, particularly now. And with that said, today we're discussing housing. Uh, uh, the students have already raised some interesting questions. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm not going to do any more than turn the mic over to those who are far more knowledgeable uh, about housing, uh, particularly within the context of uh, both the city's 2030 plan and in the context of the research that uh, Professor Bluestone has been doing uh, over a number of years uh, uh, within this context. So, let's go. How's it? You're on. Great. Thanks, Ted. Uh, let's see, how do we get split out of the presentation? Well, while we're doing that, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Devin Quirk from the City of Boston's uh, Department of Neighborhood Development for the Housing and Community Development Agency for the City of Boston. And I'm very excited uh, to be here today. I wanted to 
that talk to you about what I think is the most important growth topic in Boston that we'll see what all of you think, and that's the affordability of housing in our city. Um, do we have a, a clicker I can press to push through these, or should I just go stand over there? Switch mics. Great. Can, you can, can, can switch mics? Yeah. No, you, you can stop You guys can also hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, what I want to talk to you about today is the city's housing policy, and I think uh, one thing that's very clear uh, is that the mayor has a very clear progressive policy when it comes to the affordability housing in our city. He wants our city to be a city where everyone, no matter of what their age or income or, or background or race, can afford to call our, can afford to call our city home. Uh, and that's something that's easy to say. Uh, but very hard to do and takes a lot of work uh, across government agencies, internal to the city government, with my uh, partners and presenters who are here today, with many of you today who might be working in the housing industry with uh, nonprofits and with, um, educational institutions and for profit developers. There's a lot of work happening 24 7 to help achieve this progressive housing vision. Um, and uh, I want to talk to you today about a little bit of, about what the mayor's housing plan is. Um, we convened a group of people when Mayor Walsh first took office in 2014. We had about 40 housing leaders uh, take a look at what the future of Boston looks like and try to try to craft a vision and a set of strategies that will get us to that uh, progressive vision of affordability. Um, but rather than going through the whole plan point by point, there's a, you can download it for bedtime reading if you want. It's 150 pages. It's available on the city's website. I thought I'd just give you a, an update on, on three very core issues uh, now that we're three and a half years into work underneath this plan. And the first is accommodating growth, the second is prioritizing affordability, and the third is addressing some of Boston's unique challenges and opportunities. So on the topic of growth, um, I know uh, Natalia was here from Imagine Boston 2030 last time, uh, and she spoke a lot about the context of the city. Uh, the history of the city, and this is one of the slides that she showed you, and this is probably the right place to start our conversation about housing growth. Um, when uh, the city's population peaked in 1950 at over 800,000 people, it hit its lowest point in recent history around 1980, uh, after a period of precipitous decline, and then since 1980 to 2010, we've been on a, a population growth uh, uh, curve that's been pretty modest, but then since 2010, that's really spiked. We've done a lot of dem demographic forecasting, and that we expect by 20, uh, 2030, let's imagine Boston 2030, uh, to, to reach over 724,000 people. Uh, it's a, you can see what the trend line looks like there. That's a pretty significant growth in the city's overall population. And we know we need to build housing to accommodate for this growth. This growth is pushing the city's housing costs up. But we don't want to grow at all costs. And I think that's one of the most important messages I want to get across tonight. Uh, we want to grow consistent with our values. That's exactly what Ted was speaking to. Uh, you heard from Natalia uh, about the Imagine Boston 2030 values that came from tens of thousands of conversations with individual Bostonians. We heard about gender networks of opportunity, enhanced neighborhoods, areas for additional density. That's one way of talking about values. Um, you, if any of you have ever attended a BPA strategic planning area um, conversation, the BPA likes to use the term preserve, enhance, and grow uh, as they're doing neighborhood-based planning. What are the parts of the, the neighborhood where we're doing rezoning? What do we want to, what do we want to absolutely want to keep? Uh, what do we want to enhance and make better? And where, what can we, where can we grow to accommodate for that growth? I thought I'd share with you some community-focused values that came out of community planning that came from uh, the J.P. Rocks planning process we were engaged in for about two years. And these are the types of values that I know the city's leadership um, uh, really emulates and cares about, but it also came straight from the community. So let's review a couple of these. Ensure that families that have made Boston their home for generations can afford to stay here. Prevent the displacement of residential, commercial, and artistically work tenancies. Establish that existing residents should be the primary beneficiary of new growth. Advance the community's commitment to social, racial, and economic equity through planning. And prioritize affordable housing resources to those in the greatest need. So these are the types of values that we hear from our community, and they're also the types of values we want to have in our housing plan. So the housing plan itself uh, calls for 53,000 new units of housing by 2030. Um, that's the big growth number. You've probably heard that. There's been a lot of publicity around that number and our progress toward it. Uh, but it's not, just, again, it's not growing at all costs. It's very specific. We have uh, very specific income target growth goals. Um, for growth, we want to build 20,000 new units of middle-income affordable housing. 
We want to build 6,500 low-income affordable units. That's doubling our rate of production from before the mayor's plan. Uh, we want to build 5,000 units for seniors. Boston's fastest growing demographic. We want to build 18,500 new dorm beds, and by doing so, free up 5,000 units of workforce housing for city where students are living today. And we have lots of anti-displacement, anti-gentrification, neighborhood stabilization themes embedded throughout the plan. And like I said, you can download that plan and take a look at it yourself. So these websites just Google. Mayor Walsh's housing plan or Housing Boston 2030. Uh, so how are we doing uh, in terms of growth? Uh, well, the answer is good. You've probably seen a lot of cranes in the sky and a lot of new housing happening. Boston is definitely a growing city. In fact, nearly 22,000 of those 53,000 units are either uh, under construction right now or have been completed. 13,500 have been are already completed. 8,400 are under construction. Another 25,000 are in the pipeline, some stage of planning. Not all of those will necessarily be approved, but those are, we have some idea where they might go. So, for the in construction and completed units, the map on the right shows you where those are happening. Uh, they're not all happening downtown. About half of them are happening within a mile of downtown, but they're happening all across the city. So, that's the growth story. And, but that's really the smallest part of the story. The more important part of the story is the affordability part of the story. Uh, so you, again, you heard from the Imagine Boston 2030 pres presentation what an important factor housing affordability is in our city's future. Uh, you heard that Boston's median household income is pretty comparable to the U.S. national median household income, but our um, housing costs are almost three times higher uh, for median housing costs in, in, in Boston. So it's a major strategic problem when we're thinking about uh, Boston as, a, as, as being a, a competitive place to do business, but it's also a very important problem to many people who live in Boston every day. It's the, the number one issue they think, think of every day when they're facing housing crisis. They can't put a roof over their head or they can't afford or they're worried about being able to afford to put a roof over their head. Um, it's what they're thinking about every day and we hear from them every day. So uh, what income levels does it take to access housing in Boston? This chart here gives you some um, uh, information on how middle-income Bostonians can access uh, Boston's housing market. So on the far left, uh, you have um, the top end of middle-income households making under $25,000 a year. That could be one person making under $25,000 or two people making $16,000 a year. But if you make that much, if your household makes that much, uh, what share of the housing market can you afford? The story, that, that sort of upper end of middle income is pretty good. You can uh, afford about 88% of the rental market in Boston today and about 60% of the home ownership market. Uh, if you're right in the middle of middle income, uh, around maybe yeah, about $80,000 a year, you can access about half of the city's rental market and about a quarter of its home ownership market. And if you're at the uh, lower end of middle income, uh, you can only access about 10% of our market rate housing, uh, and less than 5% of our home ownership opportunities. So there's, um, we're working very hard to change that. Uh, that's only part of the story as well. This is market rate housing. One, there is good news, and something I want to share with you when it comes to the affordability of housing in Boston. Boston is a national leader when it comes to providing income-restricted affordable housing. One out of every five units in Boston, that's 20%, uh, are income restricted. That means that they exist outside the market. You have to make a certain income in order to be able to afford to or to qualify to live in that unit. And your rent is not tied to the market. It's tied to your income. And your rent, if you know, market rate rents are going up in Boston, your rent will not go up. Uh, that's important because if we're talking about displacement and gentrification, people who live in income restricted housing, the people who live in these one every five minutes, they're protected from displacement. So one question we get all the time is, when you say affordable housing, what do you mean by affordable? Affordable to whom? It's a really important question. Uh, in D&D's in the world, the Department of Neighborhood Development, we're creating new income-restricted units. Um, we create them at all levels. Uh, we're trying to go everything up from formerly homeless individuals to, to high middle income earners. But these four categories are where we create the majority of our units. And the easiest way to understand it is the rent cap. What is, the, what is the maximum rent that you would pay for a two-bedroom at a certain income level? They're all based on uh, area median incomes. The federal government tells us what the area median income is for Greater Boston, and your uh, rent caps are based on a percentage of that. So at the higher, higher end, at the right side of the uh, for uh, 
units that are 70% of Boston's area median income. Um, the rent cap is $1,400 a month. To get into that unit, if you are a one-person household, you must make less than $48,000. Uh, if you're a four-person household, you have to make less than $68,000. The other side of the spectrum, we create a lot of units at 30% of area median income. Uh, the maximum rent for a two-bedroom at that level is $600 a month. Uh, to qualify for that unit, you must make less than $20,000 a year, or if you're a family of four, $29,000 a year. So when we speak to affordable in or income restricted housing, that's really who we're building it for, for households in those income brackets uh, at those rent caps. How are we doing? So we've already created under the mayor's plan 4,000 new units that are either in construction or completed today. That includes 636 very deeply affordable units for Boston's formerly homeless. That's how we're ending uh, homelessness in Boston. Uh, and we're doing that because we're deeply committed as a city to uh, financing and funding uh, deeply affordable or, or affordable units in our city. We've committed over $100 million of city subsidy to housing creation in Boston. We've created the first line item for senior housing in Boston. We've created um, a program called the Acquisition Opportunity Program that, where we work with CDCs to help them purchase market rate apartments, and keep the people there, and turn them into affordable housing units that have income restrictions so that they're protected from, from uh, market ex escalation. Put $7.5 million to seed that program and want to expand it. We've done a lot of work uh, with the BPA and others to reform the inclusionary development program uh, so that when private developers are building housing in our city, they have to set a certain percentage of it uh, aside as income restricted housing. We've increased that percentage in a lot of areas. We've increased the cash out. And we're using that tool to make sure that um, we're not leaving any money on the table so that when private developers are building uh, housing in our city, we're maximizing the contribution to affordable housing. And to show greater bother, to show the people of Boston's commitment to affordable housing, the, if those of you who are Bostonians in this room probably know this, uh, Bostonians voted by ballot measure in November to pass the Community Preservation Act that is a 1% surcharge on your taxes that we voluntarily assess ourselves to fund affordable housing uh, and open space and historic preservation in the city that will provide about $20 million a year uh, for those uses. I suspect at least half of that will go to affordable housing. So a lot of commitment to building the affordable housing in Boston. That's the um, income restrict say. We're also trying to build market rate uh, middle income housing, and that is more of a story about building, um, less of a story of subsidies and more about working with the market. So there are some great subsidy stories in, uh, and public private partnerships. The Beverly, which is pictured there, is a 100% um, affordable development downtown uh, that all 239 units will be workforce housing. They'll be income restricted at higher income levels than the income levels I showed you, more middle income. Uh, uh, so that's one way to get there, but we really can't buy our way to the 20,000 new units of workforce affordable housing that we need. Uh, we need to also work with the market to bring new units online that are affordable to Boston's, Bostonians at middle incomes. We already have 4,500 4, new units that have come online that are our middle income affordable. Those are households that are making between $50,000 and $125,000 a year. And there, oh, maybe this is one of the more controversial points I'll make tonight, and I'll love hearing the question and answer feedback on it, but there, we're seeing a direct connection between building housing at all levels and rents in our city. And it might run counter to what many people expect. Uh, we measure the, uh, the, the rents in housing that was built before the building boom started. So any housing that was that, would, that would came online before 2011, whether it was here in 1960 or 1900 or in 2010. And we look at the, the rents in those units separately from the new construction that's happening. Now, while new construction rents continue to go up and up and up, and you read stories about luxury housing that's coming online for $7,000 a month or more uh, for a two-bedroom, uh, rents in uh, older stock housing last year for the first time actually started to go up. It was a very moderate decrease, only 4% decrease. And this is new listings, so yeah, it has to be a vacant unit. For, you know, it's not like landlords are saying, just pay us less this year. That's not happening. Uh, but, uh, but if you're moving into an older apartment building, the rent, the newly listed rent is 
uh, 4% less on average across the city uh, than it was the previous year. So that is an indication to us that, the, that while we have to build uh, affordable housing and income restricted housing, we have to do ten protections, and I'll talk about that in a moment, the strategy of building supply also addresses demand. So finally, I want to share with you just some of Boston's unique challenges and opportunities and some of the more unique things we're doing that makes Boston specific. Um, first, uh, we're trying to build more housing for Boston seniors. Well, uh, seniors are Boston's fastest growing demographic. The number of seniors uh, in Boston will double uh, by 2030, uh, proportionally. Uh, uh, it's a story of both providing new senior-specific units, but also providing units that are lockable and have the amenities that seniors want, downsizing them, making them uh, have the support services that seniors want and need. Uh, we have built 264 new low-income uh, senior-specific units, and that's a story about using city land and new budget lines to, uh, to create senior-specific housing. We're also trying to provide seniors with support services to stay in homes they're in. Uh, we have over a thousand seniors every year work in the Department of Neighborhood Development's home repair program to help them do minor or sometimes major repairs to their homes with a no interest grant to help them stay in their homes and help, uh, help them keep up their homes, uh, sometimes accessibility features, things like that. Um, there is a not so great side of the story, which we wanted the, in the housing plan we wrote it four years ago. We thought Boston's market, uh, market rate developers will be building more senior specific housing. They're not for whatever reason, and that's something we want to continue to work with them on. There's only been 100 new senior-specific market rate housing units come online uh, in the past three years. Students. So students are another very uh, Boston-specific uh, housing challenge. Uh, there are over 200,000 students going to school in both Greater Boston. 35,000 of those students um, live off campus just within city limits, and as you can imagine, that places tremendous strain on Boston's housing market. So our goal is to build over 18,500 new dormitory beds over the course of the next 15 years. And by doing so, free up 5,000 units of workforce housing uh, that the, where those um, students live today and move them to those dorms that Boston's, um, Boston, Boston workers in Boston can live in those homes. Um, of, the, of those 35,000 students that are living off campus, more than half of them live in one to three family homes, small housing, that was built for Boston's workforce, not for Boston students. So we're encouraging schools to build more dorms, or we can say as part of their um, commitments and institutional master plans. We also know they can't really do it all on their own. We need to work with public, do public-private partnerships with private developers who want to provide uh, student-specific housing. But we're going to make our goal. Um, we're 19 percent of our goal has been completed. We've got another, you know, about half of it uh, in planning right now. But there's 8,000 dorm beds, 8,500 dorm beds, where we don't know where they're going to go. And over the course of the next uh, 13 years, we need to figure that out. We're going to make this goal happen. Uh, I'd be remiss if we, I didn't mention homelessness in Boston. That's not in the mayor's housing plan itself, because we have a whole other plan on ending homelessness in Boston. Uh, it's called Boston's Way Home. I encourage you to check it out as well. Uh, a couple of important facts. We have ended chronic veterans homelessness in Boston. There are no veterans sleeping on uh, our streets tonight that have been homeless for more than 180 days. But when you say chronic homelessness, that means homeless for more than 180 days. Uh, we've housed over 800 homeless veterans. We are working to end all chronic homelessness in Boston by the end of next year, and I think it's an achievable goal. Uh, we're well on the way already. If you add up all the years of chronic homelessness the city has ended over the past three years, it's 2,300 years of people sleeping in shelters and on the streets that we've now provided those people homes. It's, it's very, we're very proud of, something that's very um, key to the mayor who he is. We also launched uh, the nation's first housing innovation lab, and that has a lot to do with uh, who Boston is as an educational community and the resources we have in our academic institutions. Uh, so we have a housing innovation lab embedded within the D, the Tunnel Water Work of Tamara, which I'm sure Tamara will speak a little bit about. I've done a lot of work in contact cutting, which I'll let her speak to. We've done some work on uh, improving even density bonuses in Boston so that when um, developers build at higher densities, they're required to put uh, additional or higher percentages of those units uh, as uh, income restricted affordable housing. Uh, the Innovation Labs work with community land trusts. They're working on a policy to create accessory dwelling units. Those are when you take an existing home and you take 
what is you know, one unit or two units and break it up into a third unit. So there's new unit creation within the envelope of the existing house. So they, that's one way to create new units without a lot of new construction. Uh, and they're also piloting the program right now that's a senior home share program. It's uh, to partner uh, students in Boston with seniors who have larger homes and want to rent out bedrooms. And it helps the seniors maintain their homes and helps students find affordable places to live. So that's an ongoing pilot right now. We've launched the nation's first office of housing stability. Uh, so this is one-stop shopping for people in housing crisis. It's, our, it's both the place to call if you um, are worried about eviction, but it's also the, it's our policy uh, department for shaping anti-displacement uh, programs and legislations. They're working on everything from uh, right for tenants to purchase a home if, they're, if they live in a foreclosed home, or right of first refusal at least. Uh, they're working on the income tax credit for um, landlords in charge below market rent, and they're working on a right to legal counsel uh, for those who are facing eviction. So they get about 125 calls a week already, and they've been in existence for about a year. Uh, and really what they're trying to do is coordinate all of Boston's housing crisis resources and get people in need to the right resource for them. Uh, something else I wanted to mention is that the city has, uh, like many uh, older cities, uh, uh, vacant lots that the city owns through tax foreclosure. Many of them the city has owned for many years. We're not you know, Detroit or Baltimore who have, who have thousands of these. We have a couple hundred. And now is the time for us to be using these resources to achieve our community development and housing goals. So we've targeted 250 of these lots and said, hey, this is a perfect spot for housing. We should make it affordable housing. Uh, so we're going to create 300 new homes. A third of them will be market. A third of them will be middle income affordable, and income restricted. A third will be low income affordable ownership opportunities. And along the way, we'll take something that was a cost center for the city, so that we could spend money cutting the grass and actually turn it into tax revenue and provide uh, construction jobs as well. And on the bottom there, you can see some of the pre-approved designs for, for those homes. Many of them are coming to mind neighborhoods now. Finally, I, you know, a lot of my presentation has been positive, like what, are, what is the city doing, what have we accomplished, but I want to acknowledge that there are challenges, and we can certainly discuss the challenges. Uh, the, construction, the cost of construction in Boston is one of them. It's very hard to make the numbers work on middle income affordable housing. Uh, if the cost to create the housing is greater than what the, you know, the market rent is in neighborhoods, and that's true in, true in many neighborhoods of the city. Uh, we also have to build a lot to meet our goals. We're going to make 53,000 units. Uh, we have to build 66,000 units a year. Uh, and uh, doing that right in a thoughtful way that will be supported uh, by community members is difficult. Uh, it's really important. We want to, like I said, grow consistent with our values, but if we don't grow, uh, one of our concerns as, as housing policy people is that one of the fastest ways to displacement is to stop growth. Uh, and if we didn't have, we're not, we're not providing new um, opportunities for housing, if we're not capturing value from the private market and turning it into income-restricted housing, that people will get displaced. So we're worried that NIMBYism can lead to displacement. Uh, another big challenge for us is home ownership rates in Boston. We need to do more uh, to address racial disparities in home ownership uh, and, and mortgage lending in Boston. Only 10% of home mortgage uh, lending went to households of color last year. That's abysmal. That's, a, that's something we need to change as a city or the city we want to be in, the equitable city we want to be. Uh, and we need to increase access to home ownership across the board. And finally, support for federal support for housing, which is where we historically have gotten a lot of the money to get to the place where we are when every five months is income restricted is drying up and, and very questionable. The president uh, proposed to zero out the community development block grant program. Fortunately, I don't think that's going to happen, but it would be uh, devastating for our housing programs if it did. So last slide, just to put it all in context for you, uh, we have a, a um, city where for our goal, uh, what the values of our mayor and our, our populace is we want to People of all incomes and backgrounds can afford to live here. We have a housing plan. It works with the Imagine 2030 uh, land use comprehensive plan. Uh, we have pro growth, but anti displacement and pro equity values. And everything I talked about could probably be um, put into one of three buckets or strategies. The first are the market driven strategies, capturing value from private developers, adding supply, seeing the rents drop in older housing stock, building norms, things like that, that, that are really about market rate construction. Uh, the second are the affordable housing strategies, putting $100 million worth of city money toward income-restricted housing, uh, 
using public land to create neighboring homes, form a community land trust, pass the Green Reservation Act, those things. And then finally, there are things that we can do to protect people uh, in the housing they're in, uh, and give them access to resources like the Office of Housing Stability, tenant protections, senior home share services. I, I would sort of, sort of try and sound, I haven't used this slide before, uh, but I, I sort of think that this is a, a good way to conceptualize uh, how Boston's housing strategy works in, in three, three very large buckets. So with that, I'm turning it back to Ted, and, or Barry, or who I'm going to hand it off. All right, to Barry, to, I think. <laughs> Center for almost 20 years. Uh, we began our first study back in 2000 uh, when the Cardinal Law, the Archdiocese, and the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce asked us to do a study of what was going wrong with housing. This was all the way back in 2000 before many of these demographic trends even occurred. And then in 2002, the Boston Foundation came to us and asked if we'd be willing to do a report on how we were doing. Because in that very first report, uh, for Greater Boston, not just Boston itself, but think about the kind of five counties of, of Essex, Middlesex, Norfolk, uh, Plymouth, and Suffolk counties. About half the population of the state lives in those five counties. Um, we would need to create about 36,000 new housing units over the following five years, over and above regular production. So we needed 7,200 more units per year uh, in order to have home prices stabilize. So the question was, were we doing it? And the answer was, no. We weren't coming anywhere close. And the result was is that housing prices and rents continue to rise. And until very recently, have continued to rise. And they're, they're still rising for many types of units. And they're rising a lot outside of Boston. We're going to see that. So what I thought I would do tonight um, was to kind of give you some background history and then talk about some new ideas that have been coming forth. Devin's been involved in it. Sheila's been involved in it. Tamar Tamara has been very much involved in it. Construction companies, developers have all come together and are trying to help solve this problem that the mayor has so eloquently pointed out. So let's take a look at the problem. Um, I'm going to look uh, at specific areas of this problem. But one of them, particularly since I've been working in universities for 47 years, is that we have a lot of students, as Devin pointed out. We have a rising graduate student population, even though our undergraduate population is stable and may decline. We also, thank God, have this huge medical complex here, but that means we have literally tens of thousands of interns and residents and other young people who are coming here. Uh, we have also tech-savvy entrepreneurs. We have all kinds of new young people coming from around the world to work in life sciences, something I discussed this morning on, w, on, w, on Channel 7, uh, WHDH, which will be this Sunday. And the problem is, is that's good news bringing those people here. Uh, that's why Boston is a prosperous city today, and it was nothing like that when I arrived here in 1971 from Detroit, Michigan. Coming from Detroit, I was amazed that I was going down in terms of <laughs> standard of living. Um, millennials, I happen to have one of my own, but living in Chicago, um, afford housing by doubling up, tripling up, or quadrupling up, uh, and they are able to take over units that are, let's say, two, three, and four bedrooms, as Devin was pointing out, uh, that were built, as you'll see, for working families. And the result is that working families, lower middle income families, and even many middle income families are being priced out of the rental market and cannot afford to buy into the condo market. Uh, so given the exorbitant cost, and in fact, we just saw that in one of Devin's slides, of building new family size units, I saw here three bedrooms or more is 4,700 bucks. Uh, the real question is, is how do we provide housing for the people uh, based on the values that the mayor has set forth? Working families uh, who have, you know, in this city, 
a median household income of about $55,000. Right now, if you looked at one of other Devin's slides, I wish we could go back to it, um, he showed what percentage of uh, housing was available to people at different income levels. But at 50,000, it was only 9%. 50,000 is just a slightly below the median, which means half of Bostonian households fall below that. Okay? So if a working family were to come here, let's say a family of four, uh, to try and find a house here, uh, they'd only find 9% of the units here are available to them. Okay, so what is the answer? Well, there are many answers, and uh, the city's working on senior housing, they're looking for low-income housing, they're dealing with homelessness. But being here at a university, uh, working with a lot of people between the ages of uh, you know, 24 and 34 years old, or something in that range, we've been coming up with the idea of how do we, and indeed it's part of the mayor's plan, how do we develop a substantial amount of appropriately sized housing for this growing population of 20 to 34 year olds. And we need to make it attractive enough that they would rather live in the new housing than share the third floor of a triple decker in Dorchester with three roommates. I call those millennial villages. Um, the uh, conservatories here in town, uh, led by Boston Conservatory, Berkeley, New England Conservatory, are talking about artist villages based on this. Um, but it's going to require a new collaboration. And I've been thinking a lot about the economics and politics of this. But let's go back, 1870 to 1920. The population of Boston explodes. It triples in that short 50-year period from 250,000 to 750,000 and will peak in 1950 at 801,000, as Devin pointed out. How did we house them? We built a new kind of housing called the Triple Decker. And the Triple Decker and, two, and duplexes now, today, if you looked at Cambridge, Boston, and Somerville, put those together, that's almost 40% of the housing stock are in units in duplexes and triple-deckers. We were able, essentially, to house a tripling of the population in 50 years by developing a new style of housing. Right? Then we had the second demographic revolution, the baby boom generation. And the population, as you saw in one of Devin's slides, plummets from 801,000 to 564,000 in the city of Boston itself as people fled to the suburbs. And much of that occurred before busing in the same way it did in other major cities. Where did they go? They went to the suburbs. The, town of Ch the city of Chelsea lost 35% of its population in that 30 years. Boston lost 30% of its population. Even Cambridge, Cambridge, lost one-fifth of its population. Where did it grow? A little bit in Newton, a rich suburb, much more, 57% in Braintree, Sharon 180%, and there were communities that I couldn't even put on here because they grew by 10 times. Um, Burlington, for example, uh, grew 10 times in just 30 years. And now we have the third demographic revolution. And again, Devin touched on this. We've seen a recovery in the population of the city of Boston, and if you look, however, at that growth in the population of new people coming here, back in the year 2000, according to the U.S. Census, 20 to 34 year olds comprised one-third of the region's total population. That's where the program one in three began in the city. But if you look at between 2000 and the 2010 census, 20 to 34 year olds were responsible for nearly three quarters of the growth in the population of Boston, Somerville, and Cambridge put together. And, overwhelmingly, that growth was in Suffolk County, essentially in Boston. Okay? We also know from various projections that Greater Boston, and I'm not just talking about Boston here, these five counties will see a significant population growth of about 342,000, and that's going to create about 163,000 more households that need housing. A household is a group of people who need a home. Uh, so that's about three times Greater Boston of what the city itself has projected for that period of time. That is a huge demand. And the question is, how do you fulfill that demand, not just in the city of Boston, but in the whole region? Um, a large part of that will be in the inner core. Uh, those are young people wanting to live in the city, wanting to live close to the downtown areas. Uh, so that will make up about 203,000 of 342,000 increase in the population. And then regional urban centers will grow it's the older suburbs that are actually going to grow the slowest, according to this. Now, that may prove wrong 
if in fact home prices and rents continue to rise in the central city, in the inner core. Because more and more of my friends, and particularly my son's friends, who are in their 20s and early 30s, are moving further and further out <coughs> as they grow older in order to find something they can afford. Okay? Uh, again, there are two demographic bulges here. It's the 25 to 44 year olds. Those are the millennials who are going to be coming up in that age. And seniors like me, the 65 <laughs> to 74 year olds. That's who we really have to house. Again, I'm just reiterating something that Devin was pointing out as well. So here's the triple decker in 1910. Here's the identical triple decker in 2010. <laughs> it's exactly the same, except it now has air conditioning. And oh, the people who are living there look different. The other thing is, because the demand for these triple deckers have been driven so much by these young millennials coming here, the price of a single unit of a triple decker in Greater Boston, mainly Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston, has literally doubled in, in, just since 2009. This is a great investment deal if you're an investor. Uh, but what's driving that is the rents have gone up so fast that it makes these units extremely valuable. And that's what I see as a major problem. If that's 40% of the housing stock and it costs $4,700 a month uh, essentially to buy, to build a new unit for a household of three, four, or five, then we have to find a way of taking that housing stock that was built between 1870 and 1920 and reestablish it as the housing stock of the future for working families. That's the key. Rents are up 59% in uh, the inner core uh, since 2009. Uh, they may have dipped a little bit this year, uh, but not very much. And what that means is the media renter, renter income between 2000 and today went up by 13%, mean effective rent went up by 21%, and if you didn't get some kind of discount, it went up by twice as much as your income went up. So, while incomes have stagnated, rents have continued to rise, meaning affordability is a worse and worse problem. You can also see this in this table, where you see the percentage of renter-occupied households in Greater Boston who are paying more than 30% of their income for rent. That should be the most you should have to pay. That's up from 39.2% that moved to more than half of all households. These are census data. More than half by 2011 were paying more than 30% of their income, and more than a quarter were paying more than 50% of their income for rent, which means they have to pay for everything else, which, uh, you know, beyond what they pay for rent. And the percentage of households with mortgages in which their principal interest in taxes amount to more than 30% of their gross income went from 27% in 2000 to more than 40% in 2011. That's the affordability crisis. What it has also meant is that because Boston has done a phenomenal job, actually, at providing low-income housing through public housing, through Section 8, through state subsidies, much more so than other parts of the country, and that's part of the reason why our inequality is uh, so high statistically, is that we still have ways of keeping, it, keeping poor people here. Other cities have just kept them kicked out, and therefore their inequality is much less. But we're losing the middle. We're losing the middle because that's the housing we've not been able to produce. Uh, so what does the future hold for demography? Again, same story. What we've seen recently is what we're going to see in the future. A uh, massive increase in seniors and a large increase in the millennial generation. And what that will mean is a demand for much smaller units. Right? Single millennials, couples, and seniors like myself who are now living by themselves. Um, we're only going to need about 22,000 more unit, uh, households will have four or more persons in them, as opposed to 155,000 having two to three. And in fact, 138,000 of those households will have only a single person, uh, an aging senior uh, or a young person who's living alone. So we need housing for three groups, young millennials, working families, and aging baby boomers. And what we need to do is find a strategy to do all three. The mayor's working hard on that problem. Uh, but we're trying to give them, and a lot of us uh, are trying to give them a lot of help. So let me talk about just solving one part of the problem, which hits home right here at Northeastern University and all the other universities here. Uh, millennial villages. The idea would be 
uh, to focus on getting young people into appropriate housing for them and free up, literally, tens of thousands of units of housing that was originally built for working families but has now been taken over by young people, some of you in the room. So a range of units, and I think uh, Tamara will talk about these, small micro-apartment units to studios and multi-bedroom units, uh, aimed to a great extent at graduate students, not undergraduates, we need the dorms too, but graduate students, medical students, other millennials. Uh, and these can also vary in price. Uh, right here at Northeastern, we have starving graduate students. I also have a few students who are beeping me out of the parking space in their uh, Ferraris. Uh, they can afford more than Formica. Uh, the well-heeled student, we can build housing, which is not only different, you know, in the same building, uh, different sizes, but also uh, of different quality and value. And we can even do some cross-subsidy from the very rich to the others. Lots of common shared space. That's what they don't have now. Uh, lounges, laundry facilities, seminar rooms, study rooms, music practice rooms, which will be very important in the artist village we're talking about, workout facilities, and so forth. Uh, ground floors with uh, retail establishments, a Trader Joe's, uh, a dry cleaner, whatever, uh, you know, a grocery store. Roof gardens for parties and barbecues, near public transit, and a few parking spaces for zip cars and bicycles. So, you know, you have the hot date on Saturday night, you take out the, uh, uh, you know, the, the small little uh, Cooper S. Uh, but if you're going to, uh, you know, the Home Depot, you, you get to take a van. But most of us are going to be going around in bicycles. And storage lockers, I've seen that. Okay? Uh, we'll hear a lot more about what that might look like because the person who's developed more of this and more exciting housing is in the room and will be speaking right after me. Uh, here's some ideas of what that might look like. Uh, it, this is not junky looking housing. It can be really beautiful housing. And finally, how do we get it done? So we talk about a new collaborative which has a role for a lot of people, private developers. Uh, as Devin said, we're not just asking the universities to put together uh, plans for their dormitories, but how do they work with private developers? How do you do private public partnerships? And um, we have a lot of developers who are now talking about wanting getting involved in this market. Um, uh, we need to have some kind of income restrictions on that, uh, so that works. Um, we should get quasi-public agencies involved that could help play a role in financing, mass development, mass housing, the Mass Housing Partnership, the Mass Housing Investment Corporation. Very importantly will be the role of the universities and teaching hospitals in not only marketing this housing, uh, but also finding a way to take master leases. That is, you could imagine Northeastern University, Boston University, Boston College, UMass Boston, one or two other schools getting together, again, not for their undergraduates, but working with a private developer or developers to put up housing that they would all take a part in, including maybe bringing in some of the teaching hospitals, MGH and Beth Israel and the Deaconess, uh, so that you'd have in the same building uh, you know, young people who are musicians, uh, x-ray technicians, engineers, and people building the next iPhone for under $1,000. <laughs> so they have to market the housing, and um, any units that wouldn't be occupied by uh, uh, their grad students or their, could go to recent, recent alumni. So when we talk with the artist community, we know that many people coming out of the New England Conservatory at the beginning of their careers are not yet making those million dollar records. <laughs> They need housing, and this housing could be for them as well, and we could keep them in Boston rather than having them go to Austin, right? We need to work with architects and construction firms for new designs for affordable units. And we've been now talking with construction firms and developers about something really exciting, building a manufacturing facility somewhere in Boston or in greater Boston that could build either modules or panels using some of the newest technology. We've got to get the building trades involved, and in fact, we've been working with the construction trades um, and to encourage them both for some relief on their uh, normal labor rates, uh, but also to find a way to get some of the older construction workers working with young apprentices, particularly in these manufacturing facilities, maybe teamed up with Madison Park Vocational School to provide lots of jobs at the same time we're providing lots of housing. And we, of course, need to get uh, our cities and towns involved. We need some zoning reform. Uh, we need to lower, which we've already done in many cases, uh, like the Beverly Project, uh, parking requirements. 
and use, as Devin pointed out, surplus municipal land. State government can be involved with the state bonding authority we have, providing low interest loans for such development, state tax credits, and also using some state-owned land, uh, surplus land, uh, owned either by the state or by the NBTA. So, 10-step program. One, working with the Commonwealth Housing Task Force, which is coordinated by the Boston Foundation, bring everybody to the table. Two, we need to conduct a demand survey among young people in order to understand exactly what kind of housing they want, at what price point, what amenities, what locations are most attractive, what rent levels. We need to get the developers on board, and um, we think one way to do that is to get Governor Baker and Mayor Walsh and other mayors in surrounding communities to call a meeting for developers, architects, companies, the building trades, and say, okay, how do we get this done? And based on that, uh, and getting the building trades on board in terms of modular and penalized building, apprenticeship programs, and so forth, uh, getting construction firms uh, talking about building such a facility, we then sit down with President Aoun, the presidents of uh, all the universities, uh, the CEOs of the major hospitals. We get Governor Baker and Mayor Walsh and the other mayors saying, come to the table. We want to tell you about a new idea. And really sit down with them and say, this is part of your responsibility. <coughs> uh, Northeastern, um, we've been looking at the amount of pilot that you paid in this year. Looks a little low. Here's one way you might help us. Okay? Uh, we also need to review, you know, look at uh, available sites. For graduate students, they don't have to be near the campus. Most of our students live all over, including in other communities, uh, so that we don't have to put all the pressure just here. You could think about, for instance, the new downtown Malden, which Mayor Christensen would like to you know, develop. Right? Put a premium on land that's near public transit, initiate zoning reform, get those agreements then between the hospitals and the developers, and then get the work done. Thank you very much. Oops. I love tag teaming with Barry because <laughs> he lays out the entire situation in terms of the research and data and then I can just follow with some pretty pictures. <laughs> Her work's much more important than mine. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm Tamara Roy, I'm a principal at Stantec. Um, we were formerly at Inc. We're architects. Um, there's about 100 of us in our office, but the total office in Boston is 250 people. Um, and my nickname is the mother of the micro unit. Um, so, I've been focusing since about 2010 on compact living and also on affordability. And I want to just I have a very short 10 minute presentation or so on um, what we at Stantec and I have been working on in that regard related to everything both of the two of them have already covered. So before I ever became the mother of the micro unit, I went to graduate school in Amsterdam with my husband. And this was this is a sketch of our little apartment we had in downtown Amsterdam which we absolutely adored, and it was only 280 square feet. But what we realized is we never once said that it was too small. It was absolutely perfect for us, so you had a nice layout. Um, but also, we spent our days at the Institute, we spent our evenings in downtown Amsterdam, which is a fabulous city. Um, and so what we realized um, as I came back and started working on housing issues was that we lived in the principles of compact living, which was having less personal space, more common space. In our case, it was the city, which was our living room. Um, we biked everywhere, and we very importantly cared about our carbon footprint, and it was very low when we lived in Amsterdam. When we came back um, a few years later, my husband and I, who's also he's a principal at Stantec, designed the Mass Art Treehouse which houses 500 students um, and follows all of the same principles. There's no parking, there's a lot of common space, there's common laundry, there's all the things Barry talked about, um, and very little personal space. And on a state college budget, we built this building and the students rent um, there for between $800 and $1,000 a month if they don't get a subsidy from the school for their housing. So what we realized, though, 
was when we talked to students who had graduated from MassArt, was that there was nothing like this in the city for them to move to once they graduated. Nothing. We could have 10 of these and it would be great for them, but instead, what they had to do was look at exactly what Barry talked about, apartments that were three and four bedrooms, start sharing with roommates, and, and displace families in, in housing. So it clearly brought us to a need. And we did a bunch of research with Barry and the Dukakis Institute, and for us, this slide is our one humongous data point, which is that over the course of the last 100 years, Boston's demographics have completely shifted, and two-thirds of our population are one- and two-person households. But if you look on the right, our housing stock, which was built 100 years ago, is very limited in terms of being able to fit those folks. It's all two, three, four, five bedroom houses. So there's this incredible gap between our housing stock and supply and the demand for the housing. So in 2010, the mayor, um, previous mayor, convened a symposium um, at City Hall with all the developers who own land um, that had been planned for housing in the Seacorp district and he was rebranding it, the Innovation District. Um, and he invited four, four architects to talk to those developers about what is innovative housing. Because he knew what innovative office was. It was gonna be Vertex and startups and the, all the life science and biotech firms he was gonna steal from Cambridge. <laughs> but he didn't know what innovative housing was. So I was invited um, and my answer, I crowdsourced my staff and I knew what the demographics were and I said, there's actually no housing for the innovation workforce that you're building these office spaces for. Um, and they can't afford to live there, was what I heard over and over again. So I was surprised that at the end of that, I mean, Devin's shaking his head, so maybe he wasn't surprised, but the, the city staff came back and said, okay, let's create an experimental zone in the innovation district where you don't have to um, court, you know, pay attention to minimum unit sizes like we do in the rest of the city. And we want to see if 20% of the units in all the housing buildings can be innovation units, which are code word for micro units, compact living, with more common space. Um, so fast forward a little bit, our office is in Fort Point in the innovation district. And we were lucky enough to build some of those, to design and build some of those projects, um, which you see here. And um, the amazing thing was that the developers at first, who were both at the symposium and then later my clients, were very grumpy about the fact that I had pushed them toward micro-units. They didn't want to do it in the innovation district. They said, tomorrow, why did you even bring up this topic? We know our business, we're just gonna build it the way we always want to. Um, and fast forward to when the building opens, and these are the, the units that rent the fastest, they actually rent for the most per square foot, um, and they're the lowest priced units in the district because they're the smallest. Um, so all of that is good because now, finally, the developers have come around and they understand that there's value to making smaller housing to fit the, the demand. The flip side of that that wasn't so good was that here are the average studio rents now in the Innovation District as of last week when I Google each of our own projects to see what they were renting for. Now this is not necessarily the micro rent because they don't list that on their websites. It's their average studio rent. But still, you can see this is incredibly unaffordable. <laughs> so if our goal was to do this to make it more affordable, well, it's the most affordable unit in the waterfront, but these are expensive high-rise buildings. They have um, you know, a ton of amenities, including pools and other expensive things. They have underground parking. Um, and the developers, one developer I actually heard put his first three micro units on the market for $1,800 a month. They went so quickly that they said, uh-oh, let's raise it 
to 2,000 and see how it goes. And then let's raise it to 2,100 and let's, right? And they're doing it because they're private market developers and they'll, they'll rent for what the market will bear. So it was a great experiment in compact living. Um, and I actually tour um, developers from across the country um, in some of our projects. And you can see on the upper left, that is one of the micro studios. It's a beautiful unit. It may be small in numbers of square footage, but it's very spacious and it's got a lot of light. And then, uh, and actually one of our staff members lives in one of those. Um, and then you have access to these fantastic common spaces. So in 2016, I was elected to be the president of the Boston Society of Architects. And one thing that they ask you when you become president is what is your agenda for the year and what can we help you with? And I said, I want to create a public relations campaign to educate people about how important small units are to provide in the city. And I want to figure out affordable ways to do it. So the first thing we did, we have a floor of the BSA that is a gallery. And we did an exhibit on a simulated microhousing building where we provided all kinds of interesting common space. It had data all over the walls about why we need to do this. And it has three mocked up units. Three. What? <laughs> the battery might have died. Get one of the other ones. All right. How's that? Good. Okay. And it had three unit mock ups of uh, both a studio, one bed, and a two bedroom that were all quite a bit below the city's metro minimum unit sizes. And we had folks walk through them, and I, I see people in the audience nodding who actually saw it. Um, but the general impression was, these are not, not small, they're, they're just fine, we can live in here, it's very well um, designed. But we know, you know, not everybody comes to the BSA. <laughs> we need to get out there a little bit wider audience. So um, I also worked with um, with D and D and Devin um, on a innovation uh, developer competition because it's one thing to talk about these things theoretically as an idea or a prototype, um, but we wanted to put out three parcels of city-owned land and ask developers to come back with a pro forma that would show that they that if they put more units on a site than we would normally allow them with less parking, that they could do, they could create a more affordable model of either rent, rents or home ownership, both. We got seven um, different proposals, and we actually were able to at least pick one winner for the largest site. The other two sites were still probably going to go out again, um, but at least we. We showed that it is possible and it's going to go into construction soon. Or at least it's going to begin its, its design phase of construction soon. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about tonight um, is the YooHoo, uh, which was my biggest initiative, even though it's, it's, it's little. Um, and the <laughs> YooHoo stands for Urban Housing Unit. Um, and it's a 385 square foot um, little unit that's a studio. Um, which we built and prefabbed in Pennsylvania for $65,000, which is less than $200 a square foot. Um, and currently, uh, buildings in Boston that we're doing are running between $400 and $500 a square foot. So less than half of what current construction prices are. Um, and I have a video that I'd like to show you of it. Here. So you enter the foyer, 
it's actually very spacious. You have places to hang your coats. You have a place where you can put furniture, um, as well as high storage. And then to the left, you have a bedroom alcove that's big enough for a queen-size bed, and you can walk all the way around it. And hidden up above, like we've learned from Tiny House Nation, <laughs> dead storage or off-season storage. A wide hallway with an eight-foot-long closet where you could put a stackable washer-dryer um, and, and a closet organizer, as well as more storage above that. Because we hear over and over from people that the thing, major thing that keeps them away from small units is not enough storage. A large Fair Housing Act uh, code-compliant bathroom. And really important thing is a walk-in shower. Because we knew that we could, millennials will do this all day long, but we wanted to attract seniors. Um, as well, because that's another target or an audience, and they said they loved that shower. <laughs> um, two couches that could pull out into beds if you have guests. And then our one piece of transformable furniture, which is a desk from Ikea, um, which you can turn into a dinner party for six. <laughs> that's my son. <laughs> um, a large the large glass is important. We actually had a screen you could pull down, and there's the projector if you wanted to have movie night with your friends. And then the thing we hear over and over again about small units is we still, lots of people love to cook, at least once a year on Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> so we have a two burner stove, we have a full size sink, dishwasher, refrigerator, and a microwave convection oven. So, and I, I love to cook, so I designed that kitchen. So then I have what people said about it, and this woman really captures what we heard over and over again, that the number of square footage didn't correspond to how big it felt. This fellow is a real estate agent in Mattapan, and he said, if I had these to rent or sell to people, my business would just be booming. I, I couldn't have enough of these. She is a student living with her parents, and she said all of her friends are doing the same thing. And if we could deliver this more affordably, they would love to live in it. And then lastly, our senior who said, I can have company, I can have people come over, but they aren't gonna stay over. <laughs> and she loves it. And honestly, the response from seniors, you know, just being able to think about seniors a little bit and be conscious of it in the design um, really brought back that incredible positive feedback that we heard. So we got a tremendous amount of press. The response was fantastic. 98% of people who went through the unit and toured it said that they would love love to see it in their neighborhood, or they're cautiously optimistic about it. Only 2% said, no way, not here, never. Um, so now what we're doing is revisiting the minimum unit sizes because you know across the city, you still can't do this anywhere except in the innovation district. And we're working with the mayor's office to try to reduce these numbers quite a bit. And lastly, as we talk a little bit regionally, um, there's less expensive land. This happens to be Medford. Um, had a wonderful couple of meetings with the mayor of Medford um, because there are many, many suburbs that have a ton of housing, single and double, and, uh, double family housing, two family housing, but they don't serve these other groups at all. And so we were focusing kind of laser on Medford Square where it's a kind of deteriorating downtown with a lot of parking lots, and we pitched it to her that you could put compact living here, you'd have less cars than you would if you had large units, you'd have, but you'd introduce this whole new population into your city, and you'd give people either as a feeder to your larger housing before they get families, or even when they start to get older, they can still stay in their town and live smaller. So we did this quick little um, master plan image um, and now I've been taking this on the road and been talking to the mayor of Everett and the mayor of Chelsea about how we can help them rethink these little pockets of urbanism that they have that are perfect for this group um, build their tax base and live in the places and be more affordable than Boston um, so that's my last
slide. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's what we've been up to.